All right, everyone, we might as well go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm sure people will, will keep trickling in. Um, but for those who are here, I want to respect your time and thank you again for showing up. My name is Lucas Kwong. I am an assistant professor at City University of New York, and I'm the author of this open letter on anti-Asian racism and Christian nationalism. Some of you, uh, of course, have read the letter and signed on, but um, what I'm going to do today is just kind of walk through the core claims of the letter so that if you have signed, maybe you can have a better sense of how to communicate with those who have not but are interested what this is all about. And if you haven't signed, hopefully I can give you at least a clearer picture of where we are coming from with this letter. So what we're going to do is uh, there will be, you know, I'm going to present uh, the letter, then a couple signatories will talk about their own uh, reasons for uh, for signing and introduce who they are, where they're coming from, and then we will open up the floor to uh, to questions. All right, so um, some of you might have uh, already participated in several uh, events during this week of action sponsored by the group Lamenting Christian Nationalism. Um, I am going to talk about Christian nationalism a little further on in this presentation, but uh, we're going to uh, uh, um, approach that topic from a slightly different angle than preceding uh, presentations that this week, and that is from the perspective of talking about anti-Asian hatred and violence. These are photos from a recent um, a recent event, and uh, you know it's great that people are in fact speaking up and uh, and you know making their voice heard, uh, but it's not a moment too soon. Um, there has been an indisputable explosion and escalation in anti-Asian hatred over the past year, and it's particularly evident when you just compare the first quarter of 2020 versus the first quarter of 2021. This is from a report by UC San Bernardino's uh, Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism, and uh, you can see here, particularly on uh, the right side, this is the um, these are the uh, stats for uh, San Francisco. Um, th there has just been a, a huge spike first quarter 2021 of reported hate crime incidents against Asians versus um, the first quarter of, of 2020. Now, there is some dispute about how much and to what extent there has been a spike um, in light of the fact that, of course, Asian anti-Asian hate has always been present in America, sadly. But at, at this point, I think it is hard to dispute that it is getting worse. Uh, there has been a, 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 a ramping up of violence and verbal harassment. Um, so if we move on and we think about the um, the reporting forum stop AAPI hate as another metric of this problem. March 2021 alone, the number of total reported incidents to stop AAPI hate surged from 3,795 to 6,603. So there was almost a doubling in number of hate crime incidents reported to stop AAPI hate. Um, and and it's, it's sadly fitting that this happened in March 2021 because that parallels what happened in March 2020. That uh, is a key month in, as it turns out, the story behind this open letter. That was a key month in which politicians inflamed uh, paranoia and prejudice against Asian Americans. Um, and this is not a, 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 a phenomenon that is restricted to the quote unquote, you know, reactionary South, not just restricted to certain parts of the country. This is a poster that was posted in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, which is my former neighborhood. Um, and if you can read it, um, it says Chinese are, I think they meant destroying in their haste to uh, blame China. Uh, they neglected to turn on spell check, but Chinese are destroying Bay Ridge um, and blaming Chinese people for massage parlors and, quote, dirty Chinese restaurants, the Chinese virus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera right? And that was in my former neighborhood. Um, the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism confirms that whereas other hate crimes went down uh, between 2020 and 2021, 
uh, anti-Asian hate went up. Uh, so, so it is very clear that there was something specific going on in terms of this escalation. So that the question becomes, how did it start? And I think it's quite clear when we look at the evidence that um, March 2020, which as we already said, was a critical month in the ramping up of rhetoric, um, was also the month in which hate crimes were on the increase. And there is a direct correlation between the escalation of rhetoric and the escalation of violence and harassment. Uh, this is a graph uh, that was created by the Digital Forensics Lab sponsored by the Atlantic Council, uh, which is a research group that focuses on um, political analysis. And they measured the retweets containing dog whistles terms and retweets mentioning race in relation to dog whistle terms. Um, and you can notice that um, the retweets that contained uh, dog whistle terms, uh, there's an, a, you know, a, a huge spike here. Uh, as well as here. And those are quite clearly um, pegged to Paul Gosar's use of the term uh, Wuhan coronavirus, uh, Mike Pompeo's use of the term, Trump's use of the term, McCarthy's use of the term Chinese coronavirus. Um, one researcher for DFR said it's quite clear that, you know, that it's politicians even more than influencers, quote unquote, like uh, Tucker Carlson, who are driving up this rhetoric. Um, and you can also see here, this is another uh, graph by DFR lab showing the number of articles that were published each day relating to the coronavirus. You can see here the green stands for Wuhan and virus and Wuhan coronavirus. So people were using those terms in early to mid uh, 2020. And then once the WHO made clear, well, first, once it was clear that the virus was spreading outside of Wuhan, and once it was clear that, you know, according to WHO, that these weren't necessarily accurate ways to describe the virus, use of those terms went down. Then, March 8th, following the language from conservative politicians, we see a spike again in, in the green. Not, quite, not, not as much as before, but a noticeable spike in the use of that, um, that rhetoric. Uh, and similarly, a spike in, in Chinese coronavirus. Right, so there is quite a clear documented correlation here between the denigration of Chinese people and uh, by politicians, and generally the uptick in anti-Asian sentiment. Um, so, who are these people, and uh, what what exactly did they do? Well, we already talked about Paul Gosar. Uh, here he is speaking at at the America First uh, Political Action Conference party, a quite you know explicitly fascist. Uh, uh, conference earlier this year, he basically birthed use of the term Wuhan coronavirus. You know, uh, it didn't exist prior to his tweet. So within one hour, uh, that phrase was retweeted 25,000 times. Uh, meanwhile, Bill Hagerty over here, who is being sworn in on a Bible senator for Tennessee, he's one of three Republicans whose tweets collectively accounted for 93 percent of all Chinese anti-Chinese rhetoric from GOP candidates between January 1st and August 31st. So think about that, 93% of all anti-Chinese rhetoric online. Um, he was responsible for at least a third of it. And he actually, um, and this was measured uh, by Stop AAPI Hate during the period between January 1st and August 31st, his account featured one 0.7 times more uh, more uh, anti-Chinese tweets than Donald Trump's own account. So he was kind of gunning for the prize, so to speak, in trying to outdo even Donald Trump's racism. Uh, over here, of course, this gentleman is Senator Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz uh, quips in March 2020 that, you know, unlike uh, the Chinese, at least Trump, quote, wasn't serving bat soup in the Wuhan province. He said this on his own podcast. And then subsequently on July 28th, 2020, he co-sponsored the Protecting America from Spies Act, which would give the Department of Homeland Security broad discretion to deny visas to persons known or reasonably suspected of espionage. So, you know, he, he really stands for the extent to which this is not just about rhetoric, it's about attempted legislation and kind of moving the uh, window of acceptability in terms of what kinds of bills can be proposed. Um, here we have uh, Representative Kevin McCarthy of 
California, which is the state that has been one of the epicenters of anti-Asian hatred. And, um, you know, he used the term Chinese coronavirus uh, on March 9th. So he was one of the other big drivers of anti-Asian rhetoric that month, uh, March 9th, 2020. And, uh, you know, later sat on a committee called the China Task Force that in September put out a report that, you know, basically said that the, the CCP was single-handedly responsible for killing thousands, if not millions of people. Um, so this is, this is incredibly disturbing uh, rhetoric here. Um, and, you know, they're not alone. When we look at uh, the actions of people like Mike Pompeo, uh, who was also another key driver in March 2020 of using the term coronavi uh, Chinese coronavirus, Wuhan coronavirus. Uh, when we look at Kelly Loeffler, of course, deposed at this point, formerly uh, former Senator Kelly Loeffler, um, she, uh, you know, uh, tweeted, never forget that China inflicted this virus on our president, right? So that's about as blatant an example of blaming an entire country for the coronavirus as it gets. Um, she also jumped on legislation co-sponsored by Senator Marsha Blackbird, the Civil Justice for Victims of Coronavirus uh, Act, which would have held China financially and legally culpable for the virus. So there was an attempt to enshrine in law the idea that China is to blame. Here, Ben Sassi, who you know has cultivated a, an image as a principled conservative, but he too got in on the anti-Chinese rhetoric uh, in an online commencement address to high school students, no less. During their high school uh, graduation ceremony online in May 2020, he joked that students should, quote, thank China uh, for their parents having to multitask as teachers and coaches. And uh, over here, we have Senator Lindsey Graham, who... Uh, tried to push for a bill that would have prohibited Chinese nationals from obtaining student visas if the president cannot certify that the Chinese government is cooperating with efforts related to COVID-19. So, of course, these, these bills didn't get passed, but that's just to give you a sense of what they were trying uh, to do, trying to accomplish. So where, where uh, Christianity comes in you know, and, you know, I could talk about these people, I'm not necessarily gonna have time, but Marshall Blackburn also has been a key driver of, you know, saying that China has 5,000 years of cheating and stealing. Uh, uh, Tom Cotton is, loves using the term Chinese virus, Wuhan virus, and also passing anti-Asian rhetoric. Um, Dan Crenshaw uh, is one of the people who have pushed the idea that complaining or criticizing these terms as racist is nothing more than CCP propaganda. So being anti-anti-racist. And then we have Josh Hawley who says that, quote, normal everyday voters in his state consider China a threat. So implication being, if you're from China and you actually think of China as the home of your ancestors or your, your current relatives, you are not normal. You are not a, quote, everyday voter in, in his state. These politicians all are not Christian incidentally or accidentally or secondarily. They are Christian as a matter of career and branding. Paul Gosar names himself as a proud Catholic Christian. He belongs to the Diocese of Phoenix. Uh, Bill Hagerty is an Episcopal pole. He belongs to St. George's Episcopal Church. Um, Ted Cruz is a proud member of Houston's First Baptist, the Southern Baptist. Uh, Representative Ke Kevin McCarthy is another proud Southern Baptist who attends Valley Baptist in Bakersfield, California, uh, which, by the way, is a, a city which which has a, a disturbing history of being home to uh, a, a segment of KKK and neo-Nazis. Um, Mike Pompeo, a uh, notable member of Eastminster Presbyterian in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, Kelly Loeffler, faithful member of the parish Christ Cathedral of Christ the King, Catholic Archdiocese for Atlanta. Ben Sassy, member of Grace Church in Fremont, Nebraska. Senator Lindsey Graham, member of Seneca Baptist in Corinth, um, Corinth Baptist rather, in, in I believe in, in Seneca, uh, South Carolina. Um, this, this is not in, uh, accidental. Uh, and there are other examples. These are, they, these politicians have built their career on their religiosity. And insofar as they have done that, uh, they are a key agent of provoking Christian nationalists. So here's where Christian nationalism comes in. Some of you might have read about Christian nationalism and you know participated in different events that have tried to explain what Christian nationalism is 
this um this week but just a rundown christian nationalism as as described by researchers sam perry and andrew whitehead in their book taking america back for god it's a cultural framework a collection of myths traditions symbols narrative and value systems that idealizes and advocates a fusion of christianity with american civic life so basically to be a true christian is to be a true patriotic american and to truly be a patriotic American, you have to be Christian. That is the implicit uh, grounding thesis of Christian nationalism. And, you know, it, insofar as it's about fusing Christianity and civic life, it, it, it promotes preserving or returning to this mythical, mythic society in which traditional hierarchies are upheld. So uh, Christian nationalism entails a very high view of authority structures, um, which makes it all the more likely that these politicians have inordinate influence over um, Christian nationalists who are in the rank and file. Um, Perry and Whitehead sort of divide America into four categories, rejectors of Christian nationalism, um, resistors, so those who are, are against Christian nationalism, but not quite as vehemently as uh, as as the re rejectors. Uh, then we have accommodators over here, those who are sympathetic to Christian nationalism, but are not sure how much or to what extent America should be a Christian nation. And then we have the ambassadors, the most enthusiastic uh, propagators of Christian nationalism. And between them, the accommodators and ambassadors comprise just over half of the entire population, estimated. So uh, these are people who are more likely than not to have either sympathy or full-on ardent uh, conviction in the idea that this is a Christian nation and our politics should be organized accordingly. And unsurprisingly, ambassadors uh, clearly uh, tend to be more religious. They attend services more frequently, pray more frequently, and read sacred scriptures more frequently than those in other groups. So not only are they more likely to be listening to politicians, they're also more likely to be listening to their pastors. Um, all right. So, you know, what's, what's going on is the rhetoric of these politicians then is intersecting with uh, this phenomenon of burgeoning Christian nationalism out there. And it is compounded by the, the way that these politicians sacralize their bigotry, uh, basically everything they do in office through strategically appealing to their faith, right? So here we have some examples of that. Senator Blackburn saying, I know what it's like to be attacked for being a woman of faith, you know, appealing to the... Um, the uh, persecution narrative, Pompeo saying, you shall know the truth, the truth shall set you free in the course of, um, you know, praising those who worked for him in, uh, in his tenure as Secretary of State. Bill Hagerty saying, you're in our prayers, President Trump. Uh, thank you for declaring a major disaster for Tennessee. This is when Tennessee was ravaged by tornadoes and saying, now we'll have more resources to fight the Wuhan coronavirus, right? A very kind of efficient coupling of piety and prejudice there. Tom Cotton similarly saying, God bless our brave docs and nurses, coupled with saying, arrest the spread of the China virus. Dan Crenshaw doing an interview in CBN, uh, asking for continued prayers uh, for his retina surgery. Uh, and here, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, some of you might have missed this, but this was an ad from, uh, from last, uh, from the election season, saying Americans have been fined for attending drive-in church, uh, and fine for all these things, and saying that these are examples of Chinese-style socialism, so linking the persecution of uh, Christians in the states to Chinese-style socialism. Um, Moving on, there are there are a few other examples um, here, but you know whether it's it's identifying with one's church of choice and speaking at that church as part of a men's breakfast or doing an, uh, a video interview, these politicians make very clear that they want their base to know that they are faithful attending believers. I think it's it's worth looking at how this all played out in the most horrific recent example of anti-Asian hatred, perhaps, which is the, the mass shooting in Atlanta. Uh, most of us know that the killer uh, who murdered eight people uh, 
said that he was motivated by the need to eliminate a so-called sex addiction. Uh, but it's also important to note that he was a faithful member of his church. Uh, and as such, uh, as a faithful member of Crab Apple, he heard uh, a number of, uh, of sermons, uh, including the sermon before the massacre in which Pastor Jerry Dockery said that the returning Christ would wage war on his enemies. Uh, another sermon earlier in the year in which Jerry Dockery uh, named Beijing and Singapore as places where he didn't feel at home. And he used um, you know, their supposed anti-American sentiment as a metaphor for how the world, quote unquote, feels about Christians. Um, there was another sermon that Pastor Dockery delivered in which he named Confucius and Buddha as false teachers. Um, and another one in which he basically compared China to the new Rome. So you got to think about there being no corresponding positive references to Asians in this congregation um, and what that was like in terms of its influence on a person who already was developing this very clear misogyny towards Asian women specifically. And then you factor in the, the fact that uh, Crab Apple belongs to the Southern Baptist Convention um, and therefore uh, belongs to a convention in which Kevin McCarthy and Ted Cruz enjoy pride of place. And then you factor in the fact that this all was taking place in the state of Atlanta, which was represented partially by Kelly Loeffler, who was one of several influential politicians who were driving up anti-Asian animus during that, that the past year. So all of those factors, I contend, combined um, to give rise to this situation in which the killer thought that the best way to deal with his quote unquote sex addiction was to murder people. Um, and you know, there are, there are any number of further examples of anti-Asian hatred in which religiosity is invoked like this bicyclist who threw a bike at a couple saying God hates China or um, this online troller calling for the US to drop a bomb on China saying God bless Truman presumably for dropping the bomb on uh, Japan. Um, a troller uh, responding to stop AAPI hate by saying that God loving married couples are now being instructed by communists, uh, implying that, you know, this is going to affect future generations of Americans. Um, these, these sort of violations of dignity and violations of, of, of the putative spiritual purity of the gospel are, are all too evident. And in the face of all that, what do we have from the associated pastors? We have collaboration, whether that is in the form of vocal approval or approving silence. On the side of vocal approval, here's a clip of Roger Spradlin, Kevin McCarthy's pastor, uh, delivering the opening inv invocation in 2014, in which Kevin McCarthy fondly spoke of him as a dear friend and lifelong, uh, or not lifelong, but, but a longtime associate. Um, Stan Vandenberg, Mike Pompeo's pastor, here he is insinuating that the only reason anyone might criticize Pompeo is because they are enemies of the faith. Um, here's uh, Greg Matt in conducting a, quote, real life interview with Ted Cruz. This was an interview featured on Houston's first Baptist we website, of course. They did not discuss his racism during the course of that interview. Um, and uh, you know, the collaboration is not just in the form of those explicit public appearances, but it's also in providing cover by appearing to care about racism, such as in these kinds of tweets uh, about racial reconciliation or the anti-racist power of the gospel or Scott Sauls' um, blog in which, you know, he positions himself as being repentant for prior instances of being indifferent to racism. Um, that's all collaboration, you know, I think, when we zoom up and really we look at it carefully, whether it is explicitly defending a politician or, or just remaining silent on their clear abuses uh, while crafting an image that the church that this politician attends or is associated with uh, claims to care about racial reconciliation. So, you know, before, before uh, I get to the demands, uh, I do want to talk about a few um, objections that I have heard. And, you know, I do understand these objections, but I'm just going to run a few, a few of them uh, quickly. One is, I don't wish to highlight the religion of 
these politicians. So one might say, yes, what they're doing is bad, but why do we have to bring religion into it? Isn't that a bit unseemly and personal? And I would say that these politicians have already highlighted their uh, religion by making Christianity so central to their brand and their public identity. Uh, they have hijacked the meaning of Christianity, and they're doing it with the aiding and abetting of, of pastors who should know better. So if for no other reason, you know, when, when Asian American Christians find our faith being exploited to launder attacks on our ethnicity, you know, um, our religion is already very much highlighted. And um, I think it, it is only appropriate to push back in a public manner to, to make some effort to reclaim the meaning of that religious practice. Of course, there is also the objection that has to do with cancel culture, quote unquote. Um, and uh, to that objection, I would only point out that asking for repentance is not cancel culture. It is not cancel culture to say that there, there must be consequences and accountability for very public and influential people misusing their influence. Um, Grace in the Bible presumes uh, the possibility of transformation. It presumes that humans are moral agents who are capable of changing. And so uh, any project that foregrounds these politicians' capacity for change and repentance is by definition not canceling them. It is inviting them to quit canceling not only their own capacity for growth, but other people's capacity for basic existence. Um, China is a real threat, and these politicians are imperfect but necessary. Responses to that threat. That is, you know, certainly understandable, and I can, I can see the uh, concern here that, okay, you know, uh, are we now saying that simply critiquing the Chinese government is itself anti-Asian? And no, I, I'm certainly not saying that or suggesting that. Um, you know, particularly having ties to Hong Kong, I'm by no means naive about the abuses of the People's Republic of China, the Chinese Communist Party. The problem is these politicians are making the issue worse. They are deepening the divide. They're making it harder for uh, America to hold China's policies accountable. And one need only look at the Uyghur genocide. The Uyghur genocide was in part inspired by um, the West's long history of Islamophobic rhetoric and legislation. And so um, the detention camps in East Turkestan uh, and the, the annihilation of the Uyghur people's way of life um, takes clear precedent from uh, 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 persecution of Muslims in the West. And to the extent that these politicians paper over that continuity and only present Islamophobia as some kind of uniquely Chinese um, offense, uh, they compound the problem, quite frankly. Um, so I do not agree that uh, calling these politicians out for their racism entails softening um, criticism of the Chinese government. You're giving these politicians too much oxygen. I don't think they need oxygen from this letter per se. They already have plenty of oxygen. Uh, if anything, what this letter is doing is trying to take oxygen away from them in the event that they refuse to repent. You know, we are highlighting their words and their legislation in route to a demand for repentance, or if that repentance is not forthcoming, then a demand for accountability. And finally, the simplest question, what good will it do? And that leads me to the demands. Well, if uh, you know these demands are taken seriously, here are some of the things that we would like to see actually happen. Public repentance and an admission of harm. I think in and of itself, that is a powerful statement for a, for a, for a politician to publicly repent of double standards, biases, and slanders. Uh, a meeting between these politicians church leaders and the politicians themselves if they don't repent. So, uh, you know, we want to see a public record that these pastors have tried to urge them to repentance, uh, hence a public update when this measure has been taken. 
uh, that if there is no repentance, the, ch the churches institute disciplinary measures up to and including stripping offending measure members of membership, not instantly, but only consequent upon there being an unrepentant attitude, right? Uh, that the leaders offer an accounting of how such racism could be allowed to flourish, as well as plans to materially contribute to struggling Asian populations in their vicinity. That if there is no sufficient response from these churches, other members of these churches withdraw material support. So we are asking for solidarity from members of these churches uh, and also for solidarity from the denominations that if the church in question does not take sufficient action, the larger body investigate and if necessary, uh, expel the congregation from fellowship. So those are all the concrete demands. Um, and, you know, it is a fundamental um, principle of this letter that material transformation is what is needed, uh, transformation of the networks of power, money, and influence that have uh, contributed to the growth and, and uh, sustenance of Christian nationalism in America. So uh, with that, I want to turn to a couple of, um, a couple of uh, signatories uh, who are going to share their own reasons for uh, signing the letter. Uh, and I'm going to begin with um, a video, a pre-recorded video by uh, one of the uh, people who put together um, this uh, week of lamenting Christian nationalism. This is a message from Reverend Dr. May Elise Cannon. She's one of the signatories. She is uh, um, a leader of the group Christians for Middle East Peace, and uh, she's going to share some words here about why she signed. Hello, my name is Reverend Dr. May Elise Cannon. I'm the Executive Director of Churches for Middle East Peace, and I support the open letter against anti-Asian racism, xenophobia, and a response to Christian nationalism. I'd encourage you to go to the website against Christian xenophobia. Why did I sign this critical, critical letter standing up against anti-Asian racism? Because anti-Asian racism is not a new hatred. It has been around for hundreds of years. The very first discrimination of allowing people to become citizens of the United States was against um, immigrants coming from China, the Chinese Exclusion Act in the late 19th century. And so we have this history that's built on white supremacy, the privileging of not only white people, but white men, and we must stand up against it. Anti-Asian hatred has been an issue since long before COVID, but the coronavirus and our former President Trump's identification of the virus as a China virus um, has been deeply problematic in isolating Asians and people of Pacific Island descent. Um, and it has released so many people to engage in microaggressions and actions of hatred against Asian Americans. And it's absolutely imperative that we stand alongside of our Asian brothers and sisters, that we stand against xenophobia in any way, shape, or form, that we stand up against anti-Asian hatred, that we be advocates of not only love for one another, but equality and justice and human rights. So I hope that if you've not signed on to the statement, that you will do so soon and that you will support the efforts of so many who are doing incredible work standing up against anti-Asian hatred here in the United States. All right, so um, so that was Reverend Dr. May Elise Cannon. Um, and um, now I'd like to turn to uh, another signatory. Uh, this is uh, Aryani Ong. She is an advocate, community leader, attorney, and consultant. She, um, she works with the organization Montgomery County uh, Progressive Asian American Network. Um, which involves active community leaders and members who are invited to the network um, and uh, strategically communicate with other Asian Americans to demonstrate public positions on timely and relevant issues pertaining to people of color, immigrant, and underrepresented uh, communities. Um, so uh, she's going to um, just speak for a little bit about her own reasons 
for uh, for signing on. Hi, Arjeni. Hi, Lucas. I'm trying to turn on my camera here. Oh, that's all right. Oh, OK. All right. So thank you very much for organizing this event. I appreciate all the work that you've invested in connecting the dots for us. It's very valuable information. Um, as a way of introduction uh, to explain my where I'm coming from, I wanted to say that I am a Catholic. Um, my family's faith was cultivated by Dutch colonists who ruled over Indonesia. You know, while a majority Muslim country, that's where my ancestors landed generations ago from China. I am a second generation a Chinese Indonesian American. I'm also a civil rights attorney who's advocated on issues pertaining to Asian American community for the last 30 years and have been addressing hate crimes and discrimination against Asian Americans perceived as having divided loyalties. And finally, I'm a believer in democracy who wants to see America prove the diversity experiment, ensuring that people of all backgrounds feel that they belong. So I say all that because I see this issue landing smackly in the middle of the intersection of all of that. Um, I signed as an individual advocate, although I for identification purposes and co-founder of the Asian American Federal Employees for Non-Discrimination and also founder of the Montgomery County Progressive Asian American Network in Maryland. Um, and I signed the letter as a hope, a sign of hope that the uh, AAPI faith community will address four calls to action. Um, number one is to meet the challenge presented by the intersections among white nationalists, the church and politics uh, sadly, we see them embodied in certain politicians whom Professor Lucas Kwong diligently has documented um, in the website against Christian xenophobia. As a former Texan, I, I was dismayed to hear that one of those politicians was Representative uh, Chip Roy, who extolled lynch lynching at a congressional hearing on anti-Asian violence this past March. And referring to the Atlanta shootings, he said, we believe in justice. There's old sayings in Texas about find all rope in Texas and get a tall oak tree. I was horrified when I heard about this statement. I identify the tree with the cross, venerated with a kiss by Catholics on Good Friday. But the Congressman chose to evoke not resurrection, but persecution. Further, he upheld the worst racialized images in US history. At a County Council Unity event after Atlanta shootings, the message that I had for the Congressman was, you do not get to exploit the tragedy of the Asian American community by invoking white supremacy violence against blacks. No, not on our watch. Number two, to reclaim our faith. The main precept of Christianity is God and love. We treat our neighbors as we would God for he resides in each of us. He has interlocked us into a human family, but hate, hate divides. Number three, to actively work to make faith institutions be more diverse, equitable, and inclusive. According to a 2020 study by Dr. Sam Georgia at Wheaton College, there were 12,000 AAPI churches, who knew? How much cross-ethnic, cross-racial, and cross and interfaith exchanges or integration occur within faith communities and across Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist communities, for instance? I'd be curious to know. The Bible says multiple times, do not fear. When we know, we do not fear. So the potential to integrate these spaces offers hope to me. For to organize the API faith community who are active in their churches, but I don't know are active at the intersections of church and politics in the same way that white evangelical Christians have been since the election of President Jimmy Carter. With the recent spotlight on APIs due to the pandemic related Sinophobia and anti-China rhetoric, APIs from different walks of life who previously haven't engaged in API community or political organizing are speaking out now and building out a more inclusive API ecosystem. I ask, does that include the API faith community? Will those members and the API civil rights community lean in 
toward each other. I named these four calls of action with urgency. Why? Because we're having a moment, a moment of racial reckoning, a moment of solidarity with Blacks and Latinos and Indigenous peoples, a moment to interrupt that narrative that we are perpetual foreigners. Unless you don't know, we are facing another cyclical moment in history where US-Asia tensions render APIs as the insider threat. Let's set aside for the moment the mass investigations into 2000 Chinese American scientist researchers, the 20 point increase in contractors with ties to China being denied to work with the federal government compared to a 10 point drop for contractors with ties to other countries. The xenophobic campaign ads that ran in presidential congressional and state levels in 2020, not to mention the 6,603 hate incidents reported by Stop API Hate in the last year. In the faith community, a pastor of a church in Anaheim <clears throat> who specializes in end time prophecy conflates the PRC and that government's wrongful actions with all things related to China. The danger here is that the public can easily ascribe the enemy with the country, the people, the businesses, and by extension, us, Asian Americans, particularly Chinese Americans. The pastor evokes a conflict in terms of the biblical camps of good versus evil, which emboldens his congregants in the best case scenario to adopt prejudicial attitudes and in the worst case scenario to carry out discriminatory acts against Asian Americans. And to illustrate, he's been saying that due to Chinese labs doing DNA testing for genealogy companies, China is implanting microchips in Americans' bloodstream. In brief, I used to track hate crimes and know there's a real connection between inflammatory rhetoric and harm. Civil rights advocates are stretched to the hilt. We do not have the bandwidth to address ignorant speech that influences large church congregations. So I exhort you out there in the viewership who are members of the faith community to do what you already are doing, but in allyship with the civil rights community. Promote the faith. Neutralize the forces that manipulate love as hate, pit neighbor against neighbor, and incite hateful action against peace. Thank you, Professor Kwong, for this opportunity and this platform. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ariane, for, for sharing out of your own experience. And, um, you know, <clears throat> before I open it up to, um, to questions, I want to highlight and affirm particularly what you had to say about the the interlocking um really the interlocking fates of of black americans and asian americans um that um what what is happening to us is is not just about us though it of course involves us but to the extent that that black americans have been disproportionately affected by this pandemic uh and that to the extent that these same politicians deflect from their culpability in exacerbating the coronavirus uh, via blaming China. They're making the situation worse both for Asians and uh, for Black Americans. Um, and I said this in the earlier webinar, but it, it really does uh, evoke what uh, Martin Luther King Jr. had to say about the fact that we are bound in a single uh, garment of destiny. So thank you so much, uh, Ariane, for, for uh, speaking to uh, these issues and for highlighting um, those uh, very disturbing uh, statistics about how um, Chinese nationals who want to come here and work uh, and who up to this point have not been treated as inherently suspect, at least in recent history, are now being treated uh, as objects of suspicion. So um, I'd like to open it up now um, to either questions or commentary from anybody else who has attended. Um, whether that's questions about how to communicate with people who might be interested or whether you have questions yourself about, about this open letter. Um, and either Aryani or myself would be happy to, uh, to field those questions. You can, you can write it in the, in the chat or in the, uh, the Q&A uh, down below uh, if you see the series of uh, graphics right there at the bottom of the screen in Zoom.
Well, you know, uh, if no one has any questions, I guess it now would be a good idea to just sort of update people on, on where um, we would like to head. Have now having approaching uh, 700 signatories, um, I think it would be a good idea just to let you know what the plans are, uh, what to do with uh, this open letter in a practical sense, uh, if there are no questions. Um, so, as I said, we have reached um, around 700 signatories. And uh, here, I'm just going to get rid of these gray blocks so that um, you can see this screen, uh, the whole screen. So we've reached around 700 signatories, and I have begun collecting video messages from signatories addressing either pastors or uh, particular politicians in the letter, video as well as text messages. And the idea is to create a compendium of real communication from real signatories that drives home the point that each signature belongs to a real person who has a real family, real loved ones, and real stakes in what the church has done or has not done vis-a-vis uh, -vis anti-Asian racism. Um, and the idea is that once we hit a certain number, I was thinking like a thousand, uh, I will begin uh, officially uh, uh, emailing these churches, um, letting them know about the letter and um, um, sending them these messages as well. So I am collecting these uh, messages via the submission form on the website. Um, if you weren't able to make it to the part one of the webinar, that's totally fine. I've um, recorded uh, that part, which was just sort of going into a bit more detail about uh, what such a message might entail and how one might go about uh, crafting such a message. So that's one important thing that's going to be happening. Um, we uh, were fortunate also to uh, receive some attention in a recent article on uh, purity culture and anti-Asian racism. It's a great article in its own right by uh, journalist Sarah Ngu, and she's going to be writing another article about this um, open letter in a couple weeks. Uh, so do check that out. Uh, I can drop that in uh, that link in the chat. Um, in the summer, um, I am also planning on holding a few more events like this. So, um, you know, if you had friends or whatever who weren't able to attend today, that's okay. Uh, I'm hope for, hoping to a hold a few more events like this, uh, perhaps events in which the signatories are able to come together and, and plan uh, strategically how to reach out to their denominations. So the idea would be that if there are, say, Methodist or Catholic signatories who wish to kind of notify, say, the UMC Texas Conference that they have signed a letter highlighting Dan Crenshaw's racism, or uh, to the Diocese of Phoenix notifying them that they have signed a letter condemning Paul Gosar's racism and demanding accountability. Um, I'm going to be trying to organize that. Um, to kind of make sure that there is a, a pointed effort to reach out to the broader denominational bodies uh, as well. Um, so I will be in touch about those events. If you would like to make sure that you stay um, updated about what is happening, uh, I invite you to, well, first I invite you to sign the letter if you haven't already, you can do so here. Um, but also if uh, you would like to uh, keep updated. You can uh, sign up to join the email list at uh, this contact page, contact slash join our email list. All right. So thank you so much uh, for listening. Uh, thank you for your time and uh, for supporting uh, this effort or considering supporting this effort. Um, there are there are a, a, a few more events that are happening in uh, in this lamenting Christian nationalism week of action. Um, so I invite you to check that out. Thank you to Ariani Ong for for her uh, voice and for her work in in drawing attention to 
the activism that has really preceded, uh, you know, this outbreak of hatred uh, that has been important for so long. And, you know, hopefully we as lady uh, people affiliated with the church in some capacity uh, can support uh, that activist work by making our voices heard. Um, so if you're still thinking about how to make your voice heard with respect to Christian nationalism, I believe that there are a couple other events online uh, this weekend, including the this Pentecost party hosted by Red Letter Christians happening tomorrow at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern. Thank you to everyone uh, for signing in. I'll be posting this uh, recording um, after it has been uh, it's been completed. So thank you. A special thank you to my wife, uh, Naomi, who was indispensable in helping me uh, shape this random assortment of words and images into something coherent. And in fact, she has been a crucial behind the scenes um, agent uh, in, in making, helping get this project off the ground. So, um, so thank you to everyone for coming. God bless you. And I hope you have a lovely weekend. Uh, don't hesitate to get in touch with me if you have any further questions. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Um, thanks for coming out.